Super Mario Bros. 3 speedruns are some of the most competitive out there. It has a degree of randomness not found in most platformers. So much out of your control needs to line up. But it also requires relentlessly precise platforming through the entire game. We've already been over warpless world records in this game, but there's another even tougher category. 100%. And over the past 10 plus years, it's become one of the most coveted NES world records. This is the history of Mario 3 100% world records. So, what is a 100% speedrun? Well, for a normal warpless speedrun of Mario 3, the only requirement is that you can't use any of the game's warp whistles to jump to a later world. However, that category still lets you skip over certain levels, since you aren't required to play them all to beat the game. But for 100%, the rules are a bit stricter. You've got to complete every stage and every map enemy through the entire game. That includes all the numbered levels, forts, airships, and hand stages, as well as enemies like Hammer Brothers and Piranha Plants. It's a brutal category. You can't skip over anything dangerous. The origin of this category comes from a speedrun from December 2005, performed by David Gibbons. Now, David Gibbons may not be a familiar name to most, but back in the early 2000s, he was one of the most prolific speedrunners around. He held world records in Mario 64, GoldenEye, Castlevania 64, Donkey Kong Country 3, the list just goes on and on. And on Christmas Eve 2005, he added Mario 3 to that list. A 100% run clocking in at 1 hour, 24 minutes, and 10 seconds. Let's dive in. Gibbons played on the Super Mario All-Stars version of the game, but since all his other records were on SNES and N64 games, it's likely Gibbons played on this version since he didn't own an NES. He started in World 1 and began making his way through the game. Gibbon's first goal was to build up the P-meter as often as he could. The P-meter checks every 8 frames whether you're running and whether you're on the ground. If both are true, then an arrow builds in the meter, and if not, then it'll lose an arrow. Once the meter is full, you get P-speed, allowing you to run much faster than normal. So, throughout the entire game, Gibbons frequently tried to run on the ground and build P-Speed. In World 1, he was able to build it on several occasions, but usually slowed down and lost it slightly after. As a whole, Gibbons was going through stages quickly, but some levels looked more like a casual playthrough. 3-2 in particular had a lot of falling in the water, and riding on slow-moving platforms. Since the run was so long, he played a lot of sections safe, slowing down to ensure he didn't take damage or die. But whenever he built P-Speed, he was able to fly through levels. And all the while, he was collecting items, which the game automatically gives you after completing worlds and fighting Hammer Brothers. He saved most of these until World 7, which features many of the game's longest stages. So in 7-6 for instance, Instead of entering the door to play the level, he used a P-Wing to fly over the wall and run to the other side. Level complete in a matter of seconds. All in all, this was a pretty impressive speedrun for its time, and it got a positive reception in the community. But there were a lot of safe strategies used, and it was obvious the world record had potential to go lower. That being said, for the next six years, 
David Gibbon's run remained as the fastest recorded 100% time. During that period, new Mario 3 runners joined Speed Demo's archive, but for the most part, they focused on the game's other categories. However, for Awesome Games Done Quick 2012, a runner named TJP7154 submitted Mario 3 100%. It got accepted, meaning he'd be running it in front of thousands of viewers that January. So, TJP had to practice. He began streaming 100% runs on his Twitch page, and in November 2011, he beat David Gibbon's record. But this time, 100% looked a little different. On November 6th, 2011, TJP beat the record by over two minutes, a 121.56, and he was able to take full advantage of what had been discovered over the last six years. First off, he was far better at preserving P-Speed. For instance, in 2-2, he turned back at the start of the stage to build P-Speed, then precisely jumped to maintain it through the whole level. 4-3 was more of the same, maintaining P-Speed by mapping out his jumps perfectly. It was overall a higher level of gameplay than Gibbon's run. There were also smaller optimizations TJP made. It seems logical to jump to get the wand sooner after a Koopa fight, like Gibbon's did, but Mario eventually has to slowly fall to the bottom of the screen after grabbing it. So, if he grabs it on the ground instead, Mario falls a much shorter distance and actually gains time. He used this throughout the run to save a few seconds. But here's the thing about TJP. He was practicing for a marathon, not trying to optimize a world record. He was also a showman, never afraid to go for the toughest tricks even if they were risky. So, despite some impressive time saves over David Gibbons, TJP also died five times and took damage on numerous occasions. It made for an entertaining run, despite some obvious places to improve. But the biggest addition to TJP's run? He used every trick to his advantage. Welcome to the wonderful yet punishing world of Mario 3's glitches. This is stage 6-9. Normally, you enter the pipe and play through the level, but instead, TJP did this. It's called a wall jump, an incredibly difficult glitch in Mario 3. First off, you need to jump into the top 6 pixels of a block, and then jump again the frame you hit the block, although in rare cases you may get a second frame. That means you have 6 pixels of wiggle room, and then must time a jump down to the 60th of a second. That's not easy. But then there's stuff out of your control. In order to have the chance to wall jump as small Mario, you must be at least 2 pixels into the wall. When running, Mario moves 2 pixels and 8 sub-pixels per frame. There are 16 sub-pixels in a pixel, meaning essentially he moves 2.5 pixels per frame. Depending on how you're lined up, the wall jump can be impossible. For instance, if you happen to be one pixel away from the wall with a low sub-pixel value, you'll only be one pixel deep into the wall on the next frame, and won't have the chance to wall jump. If you instead had a high sub-pixel value, the eight sub-pixels gained would cause Mario to move an extra pixel deep, and the wall jump would be possible. The math works out so that you only have a 60% chance to get the wall jump even if you do everything right. Your sub-pixel value and distance from the wall must line up properly. Another trick that requires both a precise jump and sub-pixel luck is clipping. If you jump right into the corner of a block as Big Mario, the game thinks his head is stuck inside, and its solution is to zip you out to the right. This means you can skip straight through entering a door to play a stage, and go right to the end. But of course, in addition to needing a frame-perfect jump to hit the corner of the block, 
you also need subpixel luck to clip in far enough. Even if you get a frame-perfect jump every time, Mario only zips less than half the time in practice. As difficult and random as these tricks are, TJP was committed to going for them. He went for the wall jump in 6-9 and got it 7th try. He went for the clip in 7-1 and got it 17th try. He went for a clip in 7-5 and failed 9 times before giving up. Finally, in 7-6, he hit a clip first try, vindicating his efforts. Was this all actually worth it? Well, despite a lot of misses, TJP clearly showed that if performed fast enough, the wall jump and all the various clips could potentially save big time. A few weeks later, just before his GDQ run, TJP set another 100% world record, 120-29. It was cleaner overall with fewer deaths, and took no more than 6 tries to get the major clips in World 7. Despite a lead of over 3 minutes, TJP couldn't help himself from going all out in the last stage of the game. He started by going into the basement, and failing a clip 31 consecutive times. He then returned to the start of the level, and attempted a different clip 4 times before giving up and taking the elevator. He then successfully hit a clip at the top of the level, but it actually lost him time because of how slowly you move through the wall. He may have lost over a minute and a half in one stage, but his run looked cool, and was still a world record. Now, TJP's run stood as the official record for about 8 months. It was beaten in August 2012, and the runner to do it is pretty well known today. Mitch Flowerpower. By 2012, Mitch had already been a top Mario 3 runner for years. He got the Warpless record in 2010, and likely had a 100% run faster than TJP's runs back in 2011. But he didn't record his time until 2012. By then, Mitch's skills had risen far beyond TJP's. And as a result, he was able to do this to the world record. One hundred percent had just been taken to another level, and the way Mitch did it, P speed, P speed, P speed. He had practiced runs of individual levels for years, and was able to apply P speed techniques there to full game runs. The only problem with this record, it wasn't exactly 4K quality, a low resolution camera pointed at a TV. But the gameplay on the screen was unbelievably high quality for the time. Take 1-3 for instance. Mitch did a tiny jump over a Koopa to build P-Speed while jumping off the Boomerang Bro. Take the first Ford in World 4. This is an incredibly tough stage, but Mitch kept P-Speed the entire way through. There are some really precise jumps in there, but he never slowed down. Mitch's gameplay was not only cleaner, but also smarter. In World 6's first fort, Mitch powered up, then intentionally took damage so he could run on the spikes quickly, instead of slowly riding on the platform. There were time saves like this all across the run, allowing Mitch to be multiple minutes ahead after 6 worlds. But instead of going for the wall jump in 6-9 and the clip in 7-6, Mitch used P-Wings in both stages to fly straight up top, instead of using them for safer strategies in stages like TJP did. He still managed to get 7-1 clips second try, and got a couple clips in 7-5. It was far from a perfect run, but Mitch's 114 was the new gold standard for 100% runs. Now, when compared to Warpless, Mario 3's other long category, 100%'s leaderboard was a little different. Mitch was way ahead of the pack in 100%, but he had one active competitor for Warpless runs, a speedrunner known as Karua. Throughout 2012, Mitch and Karua were locked in a Warpless world record battle, trading the record back and forth throughout the year. Mitch knew Karua would be an incredible 100% runner if he ever gave it a try, 
and he encouraged him to start running it. So, later that year, Karua did. And in December, he beat Mitch's world record. 113.52. Karua had a different approach this run. Mitch went all out, executing as many tough strategies as he could and being less concerned about mistakes. Karua, on the other hand, went for a more consistent run. He expected to get hit and make the occasional mistake, but his initial goal was to avoid dying, something TJP and Mitch failed to do. He also wanted to have a cleaner run overall. Mitch had some slowdowns in World 5, while Karua was able to hold on to his Fire Flower. This allowed him to build P-Speed in 5-3, while Mitch had to slowly jump his way through. Keeping with his conservative strategies, Karua saved a lot of items for the later worlds, and P-Winged over 6-9 and 7-6. He also used the P-Wing in 7-9, allowing him to go straight to the top and skip part of the maze-like stage. He still went for the 7-1 clip, and got it 5th try. So overall, his safe strategy worked beautifully. Karua completed the run without dying, and ended up with a 43 second world record improvement over Mitch. The run certainly wasn't without its faults. Small time losses were scattered across the run, especially in World 6, and he took a lot of time trying to build P-Speed at the start of 7-2. But Karua said that all he wanted with this run was a starting point. He wanted to achieve a clean world record, and then return to improve it in the future. So, five months later, that's exactly what Karua tried to do. On May 19th, 2013, after a break from doing 100% runs, Karua got on a pace with a beautiful first half. He bled a little bit from slowdowns in World 5, but his World 6 was much cleaner than his last record. Karua was over half a minute ahead into World 7, but he still had to get the 7-1 clip. First try. He also gained time by building P-Speed faster in 7-2, and suddenly, he was over 41 seconds ahead going into the final world. World 8 is a very interesting world in Mario 3 speedruns. On its surface, it doesn't seem that difficult. Nearly half the stages are auto-scrollers, which are essentially cutscenes for speedrunners, and the remaining stages don't have many super difficult tricks. You don't even have to worry about the hands like you do in Warpless. You're forced to play them all in 100%, so the only RNG is a second and a half time loss from getting pulled in by a hand versus selecting it manually. So, World 8 shouldn't be that tough of a world. But the remaining levels, 8-1, 8-2, The Fort, and Bowser's Castle, they may not be super difficult, but they're just hard enough that, when combined with the pressure of being on world record pace, it can be very easy to make a mistake. With the pressure off, top runners rarely make mistakes in World 8, but everything changes when you're on world record pace. One slip of the button, one mistimed jump, and your world record chance can vanish. Three consecutive levels with a mistake. The pressure may have gotten to Karua. But incredibly, since he led by so much going into World 8, he still pulled off a world record by 7 seconds. This may not have been the record he was going for, but Karua was in it for the long haul. 100% had turned into his new favorite category, and he was willing to devote most of his attention to it. And so, throughout 2013, this is what Karua did to the world record.
four months later, Kurua had taken the world record all the way to 1.12.40. Despite lowering the record by over a minute, there weren't any big new strategies. The improvements came from making fewer mistakes and slowly adding in small time saves. An example of this is 4-1. Kurua used to never build P-Speed in this level, and just jumped his way through while slowing down as little as possible. But starting with his 1-12-40, he picked up a Koopa shell, then used it to run into a Paracoopa so he could avoid taking damage and build P-Speed. He could then preserve it across the remainder of the level and save a few seconds. This was Karua's category. Mitch was close to him at the start of the year, but as he chose to focus on other categories instead, Karua was able to pull away. And as a result, the gap between the two of them was nearly two full minutes. But then, something interesting happened. Mario 3 100% was accepted into AGDQ 2014, just as it had been two years prior with TJP. Only this time, it would be a co-op run, with Mitch and Karua both playing. So, Mitch had to get ready. He'd spent the year playing the game's Warpless and Any% percent categories, setting a total of five world records between the two. But he hadn't played 100% in over a year, and since then, Karua had lowered the record seven times. So, during preparations for that year's GDQ run, the question was, could Mitch keep up with Karua? And on November 13th, 2013, that question was answered. This was a record improvement of 7 seconds, but there's one important caveat. Mitch played on an NES, while Karua played on Wii Virtual Console. These consoles have different frame rates, and essentially meant that Karua was playing in slightly slow motion compared to Mitch. Over the course of an hour-long speedrun, it worked out that Mitch gained 20 seconds over Karua from frame rate differences alone. So his improvement of 7 seconds was a slower played run overall. But it was still the world record. Mitch's strategies were quite different than Karua's. In the World 2 Fort, for instance, Mitch intentionally lost fire to damage boost off the spikes. It's faster initially, but you lose time by not being able to fire kill the boom boom and having the power back up later. Mitch also gained time back in a few of the stages where Karua lost big time. But he had his struggles too. His 7-1 clip was 12th try. Yet when factoring in the time save from frame rate differences, it was still enough to beat the world record. <sighs> I did it. I did it. Uh... After 15 months of dominance from Karua, Mitch was back on top. But in the lead up to their AGDQ run, Mitch wasn't the only one practicing. Karua started doing 100% runs as well. And this time, there was no more Wii Virtual Console. Karua switched to playing on an NES. And so, just a few weeks after Mitch's record, Karua beat him back by 24 seconds. Keeping with the theme from these two runners, Karua's record was more consistent than Mitch's run. Mitch had lost fire in the forts in Worlds 4 and 5 while Karua didn't get hit in either spot. And instead of a 12th try 7-1 clip, Karua got it first try. He did die in 6-3, but it wasn't a significant time loss since he was already small Mario, and it was at the start of the level. It was a quintessential Karua world record. He went for fewer extravagant tricks compared to Mitch, but was steady nearly the whole way through and it paid off beautifully. Mitch and Karua continued practicing in the lead up to AGDQ 2014, but neither lowered their 100% time. But then, the day before the marathon was scheduled to start, Karua came through with one more world record, the first 111 in the game's history. It was a bit more of an up and down run, with Karua losing fire in World 3 and missing a tail swipe in 7-5 causing him to lose time going for the backup. 
But this run is notable for one particular trick Karua went for. It's not a huge time save, but is extremely difficult and punishing if missed. The trick is in World 3, saves 3 seconds, and fittingly, is named Door 3. In World 3's first fort, there's a hallway of doors that lead to different areas. You're supposed to go into the sixth door, then jump up to a higher door and enter the boss corridor. However, if you instead enter the third door and press up to re-enter the door as soon as Mario spawns on the next screen, you can enter it again and are sent straight to the boss corridor. This saves three seconds over going to door six, but it's incredibly risky. You only have one frame to press up as you spawn on the screen, and if you miss, you fall into the water and lose 11 seconds. It's extremely high risk for not a huge reward. But Karua went for it since his run was off to a slow start, and it paid off. A few days later, Mitch and Karua had their GDQ run, and then both players took a break from 100%. The world record had entered the 111s, and although there's a limit to just how optimized an hour-long run can be, it was starting to get there. There weren't many huge time saves left. The smaller things were becoming more and more important. But when Karua came back to 100% runs in March, one element of the run in particular was gaining relevance. So far, we've talked about all the execution and tough tricks required in a 100% run building P-Speed, getting clips, and all the rest. But we've been ignoring a big aspect of the speedrun. Mario 3 100% has one other major component, RNG. It's time to talk about the Hammer Brothers. The first six worlds in the game feature one or more Hammer Brothers on the overworld map. After every level you complete, or every time you die, these Hammer Brothers randomly move in an available direction. They only intend to move one space at a time, but they can only stop on an unoccupied tile, so if they land on a level or another Hammer Brother, they have to move again. All the Hammer Brothers move at the same time but you have to wait for whatever the longest movement is to stop before Mario can move. So if one Hammer Brother moves once while the other moves twice, you end up taking the time loss from a movement of two. Now, you can get some pretty long movements from the Hammer Brothers. In World 5, this Hammer Brother can't stop on the fort, and then can't stop on level 8 or level 9. So, he has to move four spaces before he can finally stop. Each additional movement costs 32 frames, or roughly half a second, so a movement of 4 loses a second and a half over the optimal movement of 1. But under perfect conditions, you can get even worse movements. If the Hammer Brothers never land on an open tile, they have to keep moving. They can even get stuck on top of each other if they meet at a three-way intersection. Speedrunner Stewie Cartman has one of the longest Hammer Brother movements on record, and movements like this can theoretically take place in any playthrough of Mario 3. It probably goes without saying that if this happens in a run, it's an immediate reset. Even without a super long marathon movement, Hammer Brother movements can still cost the player big time over the course of a 100% run. An extra movement is only half a second, but there are dozens and dozens of spots for movements during a run. In World 5 alone, getting the worst possible versus the best possible Hammer Brother luck is about 21 seconds of difference. Extrapolate that to the full game, and one speedrun to the next can have significant time variance from RNG alone. So when Karua came back to attempts in March 2014, 
Hammer Brother RNG mattered more than ever before. On March 27th, he got on a run that pulled ahead big time after World 3. This was partly thanks to quick Hammer Brother movements, but mostly because he didn't get hit in the fort like his last record. World 4 featured great Hammer Brother luck. Two movements of two and five movements of one, and he didn't have to travel far to fight them either. Unfortunately, World 5 wasn't as kind, as he got several movements of three. Still, going into World 7, Karua had built up a substantial lead. And it just kept getting better. 7-1 clip was first try once again, and he got the tail swipe in 7-5 that he missed in the last record. Karua had a 17 second lead into World 8. But we already know how hard this world can be under pressure. These mistakes lost 12 seconds combined. Still a record by 5 seconds, but World 8 was starting to become a problem spot for Karua. But just a week later, he had a chance for redemption. Karua carried an 8 second lead after World 6, but this run is notable for the new strategies Karua went for in World 7. In 7-9, he successfully hit a clip that saves 5 seconds. Instead of having to navigate the maze normally, you can go right through the wall to skip a segment of it. And in the second fort, Karua went for a beautiful strategy where you preserve P-Speed throughout the two rooms. It's incredible to watch. You must throw fireballs and time your jumps perfectly in room 1, then do incredibly precise jumps while ducking in room 2 so that you never slow down. These two strategies combined meant Karua was 15 ahead into World 8. This was his chance. But once again, World 8 stood between him and the world record. He needed a good world. And that's exactly what he got. It made for a remarkable 111.26, a world record cut of 27 seconds. The run was solid through World 5, but a gold World 6, combined with the new strategies in World 7 and a clean World 8, pushed it over the top. Simply put, this was an amazing world record. So amazing, that for the next year, it would stand on top of the leaderboard unchallenged. But even with no competitors in sight, Karua still wanted to push his time lower. In early 2015, he came back to the category, largely thanks to a few new strategies he could use to shave off some time. The biggest one was an overhaul of level 6-5, this is the infamous stage where you're supposed to build P-Speed, then fly up with a Koopa shell to clear out the plants and make it to the pipe. Building P-Speed is easy, but it took speedrunners time to pick up the Koopa shell. However, Karua began using the 6-5 despawn strat. Mario 3 only has 5 available sprite slots at a time. If a 6th sprite appears on screen, it'll simply be despawned right away. So, by running and not slowing down, then tail swiping a Buster Beetle, he'll stay on screen longer and take up a sprite slot. The next beetle is in slot 2, the Koopa is in slot 3, and the last beetle is in slot 4. With one open slot remaining, only one of the two plants above can spawn in. So, you can just fly up there and break the blocks without needing to use the Koopa shell. Using this new strategy and other smaller ones, Karua set two 100% records in March 2015, a 111.24 followed by a 111.02. The gap on the leaderboard was now enormous, 54 seconds between him and second place. He had set 12 of the category's last 13 world records. He had held the record nearly non-stop since 2012. And now, his lead over anybody else in the world was nearly a full minute. And it was a good thing, because shortly after his 111.02, Karua obtained a working holiday visa, meaning he was going to be moving to Japan for the next year. 
and he wasn't going to be doing any speed running while gone. He had plans to come back to 100% runs upon his return, but for the next 12 months, he couldn't defend his title. But fortunately for Karua, his world record seemed to be in no danger. He left for Japan, still with no threats to the record in sight. Just three months into his absence, Karua's record was gone. The guy who did it was named I Love Mario. When Karua left, he was 54 seconds behind and didn't seem like a major threat. But a month later, the leaderboard looked a bit closer. And then it got a bit closer. And finally, on June 24th, 2015, he came through with this run. The first 110 in the game's history. I Love Mario would go on to set many records in Mario 2, Mario 3, and Mario Land 2 in the years to come, but this one was actually his very first Mario World Record. While Karua's run didn't have any huge mistakes, it still had flaws that I Love Mario was able to take advantage of. His big time saves revolved around building P-Speed, namely in 4-1, World 4's second fort, and 5-5. In each of these stages, he managed to build P-Speed early through precise platforming to save a couple seconds. They added up to be a pretty nice time save. 7-1 clip was second try, and the world as a whole was quite clean. Credit to I Love Mario. He had swooped in and taken a world record that looked to be pretty safe. Karua was shocked. He knew his record wasn't perfect, but to be beaten after just three months away was definitely a surprise. But he was set on not doing attempts until he came back. Over the next few months, the leaderboard would become a bit cluttered at the top, but I Love Mario's run remained the only 110. The new year arrived with no changes. And finally, in the spring of 2016, Karua came back. His record had only lasted three months, but I Love Mario's world record lasted the remaining nine. It was still the time to beat. So how would Karua respond? Well, in the past, Karua tended to mix in other games with his 100% attempts. But this time around, he decided he was going to do an all-out grind. His goal wasn't just to get the record back. His goal was to lower the time as much as he physically could. Because the time he was aiming for was a sub 110.30. This was Karua's ultimate grind. To get there, Karua was going to have to squeeze all the time out of 100% that he could. He had a couple ways to help. Part 1 getting all the Koopa fire kills. At the end of each of the first seven worlds, there's a Koopaling battle. The fastest way to defeat them is to use fireballs, but this can be quite difficult, since the Koopalings have seemingly random patterns that can throw everything off. However, their pattern can actually be determined ahead of time. It all depends on the time spent on the overworld map between the last level and the airship. Every few frames, the Koopaling's pattern changes, so if you spend the same amount of time navigating to the airship, the pattern will be the same and you can plan your fire kill ahead. This can still be problematic. In World 2, for instance, there are multiple spots you can be before the airship. So, Karua had to plan this out for each of the seven worlds. What possible patterns he could get, and how they match with his overworld movement. It was painstaking, but it allowed him to be much more consistent with the fire kills. And part two. As always, there were new strategies in this grind. Karua implemented two big ones. The first was in 6-10, a strategy that allowed you to maintain P-Speed through the whole level and hang on to Fire Mario. It goes without saying that this requires brutally tough platforming, but the end result saves a few seconds throughout World 6. The other new strategy was in 7-7. We've seen a lot of tricks in World 7. 
But this is easily the worst of them all. The most brutal, random, difficult, and all-around awful strategy in the game. This is the 7-7 clip. To get this to work, you need to land on the corner pixel of the pipe. That means there's both a vertical and horizontal component of getting the clip. You need the correct vertical pixel, plus the correct horizontal pixel, and the correct sub-pixels for both the horizontal and vertical directions. If everything is done correctly, and you get lucky with the sub-pixels to get the clip first try, it saves 17 seconds over playing the stage normally. But getting it first try is both figuratively and literally a pipe dream. Past runners had tried for the 7-7 clip before, but not to much success. Karua avoided the trick over the years, but for this grind, the 17 second time save was too good to pass up. But every miss shaves a few seconds off of the time save, and by the 6th try, it's impossible to gain time. Karua only got it about 25% of the time by the 6th try, meaning 75% of runs were essentially killed by this one trick. An hour into the run. It's absolutely brutal. World 7 as a whole had turned into a nightmare. You've got the 7-1 clip, the 7-7 clip, the 7-9 clip, and several other difficult levels. But it's what Karua had to do if he wanted this grind to be a success. It all had to come together if Karua was going to pull this off. After many weeks of practice, in the summer of 2016, Karua got to work. On July 6th, Karua was on a solid run through World 3. He got great Hammer Brother movements and even got Door 3. The next few worlds were up and down, but he was within striking distance going into World 7, a position he had been in several times over the past few weeks. But the world got off to a good start, second try 7-1 clip. The next few levels were clean as well, including the shell throw in 7-5, and then he arrived at 7-7. This just got real. Although he lost some time later in the world, first try 7-7 was enough for a gold split. But there was still World 8. We've seen Karua struggle here before. And sure enough, in 8-1, he lost P-Speed to lose a few seconds. But he still closed it out for a 1-10-52. For the first time in over a year, Karua was the 100% record holder. He was officially back. That was the game plan to get his goal. Take a lottery ticket into World 7, pray the ticket hits to get all the clips required, then hold it together in World 8. Karua had 23 seconds to go. This is what he did over the following weeks. By the end of July 2016, Karua had a remarkable improvement, just 5 seconds away from his goal. And finally, he had a run with a clean World 8. He saved 6 seconds in that world alone, which took the run into the 11030s. There was still room to shave a few seconds off. He had lost fire in 4-1 and took a few tries to do the clips in World 7. 
but overall, it was a really clean run. There just wasn't much time left to save. With three world records in July, Kurua was flying high. These two weeks had been among the most fruitful in his entire speedrunning career. So, he decided to take a short but well-deserved break. He returned in August and started doing more runs, needing just one more record to achieve his goal. But all of a sudden, it's like Kurua ran into a wall. He wasn't seeing any more improvements. He was getting bad Hammer Brother movements, no clips in World 7, all of a sudden nothing was working. And time started to pass. September came around, then October, and the record stayed at 110.34. Sometimes in speedrunning, we set goals that are too lofty. It's much easier to imagine a perfect run than to actually play it, and it seems that's what Karua had done. He had been a 100% record holder for four years, and knew what the culmination of all his skills could be. That would be a sub 110.30. But three months after his 110.34, despite a massive effort, Karua hadn't made any progress. Five seconds away had to be good enough. This was the end of the road for Karua. And then came November 9th, 2016, when maybe the craziest run in Mario 3 history took place. Do you remember anything about the attempt session leading up to it, or was it just like any normal day? I honestly, I don't remember anything in particular about it. Yeah, the start was yeah pretty standard, I would say. The RNG was actually bad, so I was slightly behind, but World 1 and World 2, as long as you're within two or three seconds, it's not really going to make a huge difference. So in the end, getting out of World 3, the pace was acceptable. Nothing special, but nothing bad. The run really started picking up at World 4. Basically, I got B speed in every spot where I wanted it, particularly in the uh, first and the second fort. So everything went right. Four worlds into the run, Kurua was six seconds ahead, putting him on pace for sub 1.10.30 there was still a long way to go. When I reached World 5, at that point I wasn't too excited about the run. In the entire run, World 5 is the one with the most RNG. The difference between good and bad RNG for the Hammer Bro movement is just insane. So I got a really low number of movements and I just nailed every single stage. Like, the world was virtually perfect. World 6 is, in my opinion, the uh, second hardest world after World 7. It's more about the execution for World 6, and it's really, really intense. So many stages are difficult, and again, like World 5, execution was on top in every single stage. I don't think I missed a single thing I went for in World 6. I think it was my best pace by 5 seconds entering uh, World 7. So, yeah, I was definitely feeling the pressure. This was the best chance Karua had ever had to get a sub 11030. But he started off with a first try 7 1. Getting 7 1 first try, you're always happy, but at the same time, I know 7 7 is where it's gonna be decided. So I was happy, but I was just waiting for 7 7 win. And finally, Karua arrived at 7 7. On the pace of his life, he just had to get this eventually, and he'd have a golden opportunity. I think my heart rate uh, raised quite a lot after getting 7-7 first try. Like, wow, this is actually happening. Getting the 7-9 uh, zip was a bonus just the cherry on top. We had been looking at the wrong line all along. We're not talking about a sub 11030 anymore. Unbelievably, Karua was moments away from getting the world's first 109. And it's weird because on one hand you're like, did I misjudge my goal? Or is it just that special? And I think it was just that special. 
that run was, it really was special. But we had all seen Karua's struggles in World 8 before. And now, with more on the line than ever before, he had to get a good World 8. Interestingly, I wasn't feeling really pressured by World 8, even though I failed before. Despite that, I was very confident because I was playing well, so I wasn't really feeling much pressure in that regard, I think. He kept going, level by level, getting closer to the 109. And then, yeah, 8 1 happened. The truth is, I was actually not focused enough because I remember I was thinking ahead. I was thinking about a strat I was considering doing in the fourth two stages later, and I pressed jump too early and didn't jump. And yeah, we saw the results. I, I didn't know if I could even finish the run because I was so upset at myself. And I ended up getting a hit in 8-2 because of it. I just didn't care at that point. I actually knew I would probably get the record if I didn't do anything incredibly stupid afterwards. So I expected to maybe get a record by, I don't know, 5-6 seconds or something. Instead... I'm absolutely crushing my goal, despite what happened. So I had really conflicted uh, emotions about it. At the time I was really upset, but that run was so special that I still um, became quite happy about it quite quickly. What a bizarre speed run. Karua had accomplished his goal. In fact, he had crushed it, yet it felt so unfulfilling. He was in a position to take the record years ahead of its time, but fell short at the last minute. You know, after the kind of the dust had settled, did you have any thoughts about trying to lower the time further, or did you know that you were done? I briefly considered continuing and getting another PB, but it would still be way worse, relatively speaking, compared to what that run could have been. So, yeah, I just need to stop there. I'm done. That run was six and a half years ago. Karua hasn't done a 100% run since, and he stopped speedrunning as a whole in 2017. But my goodness, did he go out on top. This was the leaderboard the day Karua set the 110.19. This was the leaderboard a year later. The gap had closed by just two seconds. There's Mega Man 2 record holder El Onija in second place. Let's move another year forward. Runners were starting to get into the 110s now, but still, Karua's record was comfortably on top. At this point, we're in late 2018, and these runners with 110s, Louis, El Onija, Horstad, they were all excellent Mario 3 players but none of their runs had world record potential. Even two full years later, none of these guys could catch up to Karua. It seemed like the 110-19 was destined to stay on top. There seemed to be no hope. Wait a minute. Mitch had been a 100% record holder before, back in 2014. Since then, he had focused hard on Warpless, being ahead of Karua there for most of the last four years. If any runner in the top 10 had a shot of beating the 110-19, it would be Mitch. He had limited interest in 100% over the years, but in late 2018, he decided to give it another shot. His PB was a mid-111, and he very quickly rose up the leaderboard. By the end of November, he was in second place, 12 seconds behind Karua. He'd then achieve a 110.29, and later a 110.26. These runs were notable because they both had a chance at the world record entering World 7, but he couldn't get the first try clips that were in the 110.19. Even with the 20 second time loss in World 8, Karua's world record was so tough to go against. 
there was just no margin for error in the first seven worlds. 2019 came around, and Mitch was still seven seconds behind Karua's world record. On January 4th, Mitch got on a run roughly even with Karua's record entering World 3. He'd then proceed to lose time in each of the following five worlds. He lost Fire in 4-4 and lost P-Speed in 6-10. He missed 7-9 clip and took two tries to get 7-7. But entering World 8, Mitch was actually going to have a shot at this, because he kept it close. Losing time against Karua's record was expected. Mitch was 16 seconds behind, and could make that time up in World 8. But of course, he had to avoid a critical mistake. We did it! Nice! Nice! For the first time in five years, the 100% record belonged to Mitch. He didn't use many new strategies either. He simply let his skills from the past few years take him past Karua. Overall, it was an extremely balanced run, with solid Hammer Brother RNG and no bad worlds. And most importantly, after a two year reign at the top, the 11019 was no longer the time to beat. Mitch and Karua were synonymous with Mario 3 speedrunning. For years, when you looked at the Warpless or 100% leaderboards, their names were always in the top two spots, and now was no exception. But who's in third place? That would be Louie, with a 1.10.35. He had been sneaking up in the background ever since cutting the 1.11. While Mitch was setting the record with a 1.10.14, Louie remained only 20 seconds behind, easily the top active runner behind Mitch. And when Mitch stepped aside from 100% after setting the record, it was Louie's time to shine. In July 2019, after a steady series of PB improvements, Louie broke through with a 1.10.08, taking the top spot by 6 full seconds. This was the first time in 4 years that neither Mitch nor Karua set the 100% record. And there's one key trick that Louie was able to use to his advantage. 7-1 subpixel manipulation. To get the 7-1 clip, your subpixel value needs to be correct. This value can range anywhere from 0 to 15, and normally it's impossible to pick your value. But there's a few rules you can use to help. Rule 1. Tapping left or right for one frame will usually decrease or increase it by one value, while tapping it for two frames will usually move it by four values. Rule 2. Having a subpixel value between 0 and 6 means the duck clip will work in 7-1. And rule 3, when wrapping around from subpixel 15 to 0, Mario visually moves forward. After the World 6 Koopa fight, you have a brief window where you can set up your subpixels for the next level, which is 7-1. So, by quickly tapping right and stopping when you see Mario visually move, You'll usually stop between a value of 0 and 6. This makes the 7-1 clip much easier to hit on the first try as long as you do the inputs correctly, which is exactly what Louis was able to do in his run. So, 1-10-08 was the record. It had been 3 years since Karua's 1-10-19, and despite the run advancing quite a bit since then, nobody could match that run's potential. The 109 sat just out of reach. Louis would hold on to the record for the next few months, but by late 2019, the desire to get under 110 picked up. Enough was enough, and the race for the first 109 was officially on. Mitch was the favorite to get it, given his resume of past Mario 3 records, 
But runners like Louie and I Love Mario were close, and several other runners had times in the 110s as well. If any of these guys were actively running the game, they had a chance at this too. There was some clear time to save over Louie's record. There were a few stages where he missed P-Speed, he got some rough Hammer Brother luck in World 5, and missed the Koopa Fire Kill in World 6. So the question was, who would clean all that up first? Well, in November 2019, Mitch got on a super fast run. The first three worlds were all beautiful, and he saved time in World 4 by not missing P-Speed in the second fort. He got better Hammer Brother luck in World 5 to save a few seconds, and got the World 6 Koopa Fire Kill. The stars had aligned. Mitch was 13 seconds ahead going into World 7, but it was time for the clips. Ah, I went back to my roots, man, thank god. <laughs> Okay. He matched Louis's first try clips. Here we are again, 109 pace into World 8. Mitch needed one more clean world, and this would be it. What? Who does that? Get it together! No way, dude. When do I mess up that level? I think I've lost, like, too much time at this point. Well, it was still a world record, but once again, the 109 had been lost to World 8. Four seconds away from the goal. Since he'd gotten the record back, Mitch stopped running 100% after this, leaving the door open to others to get the 109. But six months later, barely anything had changed. Mitch was on top, Louis was in second, and pretty much the entire top 10 was the same. One exception. New to the top 10 was Maiba, who was in 6th place with a 110.32. Half a minute from the record, not being in the top 5, surely Maiba wasn't going to be the guy to get this. Right? On May 11th, Maiba got on a run that had a slight mishap with the Hammer Brother fight in World 3. He also got slow Hammer Brother movements in World 4, and missed P-Speed in the second fort. After a fantastic World 5 and a solid World 6, he was just a few seconds behind the record, but he was well ahead of his personal best. And the clips in World 7... Maiba was on the run of his life. Everything was working. Was he actually about to do this? Go straight from 6th to 1st place? Once again, just one world separated him from the first 109. It's over. How did this keep happening? He lost 18 seconds in World 8. And again, the first 109 had slipped away. It was enough for Maiba to move up to third place, but knowing what this run could have been was pretty crushing. By late 2020, nearly four years had passed since Karua's run. Still no 109. There had certainly been enough chances, but nobody could quite convert. Well, in September 2020, another runner began climbing up the leaderboard. His name was Chikubi. He took his PB under 110.20, and then into third place. Maybe he could be the one to do this. In the past, Chikubi was pretty much constantly in the top 10, but had never threatened the world record. Yet in late 2020, he began a steady march of PB improvements, culminating with this run on October 16th. Chikubi got fantastic Hammer Brother luck in the Middle Worlds. 
great patterns, quick movements, it was pretty much the best case scenario, and it all added up to an incredible 11 second lead over the world record after World 5. The best pace anyone had ever been on. He started bleeding time in World 6 with a missed star grab, late p-speed in 6-4, and a movement of 4. And 7-7 seven, seven clip was 4th try, which is good but not great. But despite all that, he was still ahead of the record into World 8. Once again, with a really good world, he could get the 109. And guess what? Chikubi played an excellent World 8. His only mistake was a very small one in Bowser's Castle. But he didn't get the 109 because he got pulled in by all three hands. Each hand has a 50-50 chance of pulling you in, which loses a second and a half over manually selecting the level. The odds of being pulled in by all three hands is just 1 in 8. If he was pulled in by one hand or fewer, this would have been the 109. Instead, he had to settle for a 110.02. A world record, yes, but this was getting ridiculous. The 109 still eluded everyone. Maybe they needed some more help. So many times, they had been just a few seconds away. With a faster strategy or two, it could push them over the top. Well, in October 2020, Mitch came back to the 100% grind. And sure enough, he had a few new strategies to help. And thankfully, they were all in World 7, the toughest world in the game. For 7-1, he had a new subpixel manipulation set up for a standing jump, which was just a little bit easier than the duck jump. In 7-2, he had a new strategy he had adopted from the TAS. Instead of turning back at the start, you can just go forward and intentionally take damage, then just barely build p-speed before reaching the gap. It's quite difficult, but saves a little over 2 seconds. But the big one was in 7-5. If you equip a p-wing and a star, then do a frame-perfect jump into the corner of the pipe, you're practically guaranteed to have the correct subpixels to clip through the wall. Now, a frame-perfect jump isn't easy, but this saves more than 6 seconds if done correctly, which is huge. Add that to Fast 7-2's time save, and suddenly Mitch had a lot more wiggle room to get the 109. So he got back to attempts, and on October 28th he had a great run going. 2 seconds behind the record after World 6, Mitch knew he had time to save coming up with the new strategies. And he did. First try 7-1, fast 7-2, the clip in 7-5, and second try 7-7. Just like that, Mitch was 5 seconds ahead, putting him on pace for a 109.57. Here we go again. World 8 stood between Mitch and the world's first 109. That's it, that probably cost me the sub 110. That's it. It didn't give it to me. Unbelievable. It's over. Ah, come on, man! GG. Ah, come on, dude. How did this keep happening? It was another record, but yet another failed 109. Karua's run four years ago set the trend, and ever since then, World 8 was like a shield to the 109. Mitch took damage, he missed p-speed, he failed a clip, it just seemed impossible to get a good World 8 on a good pace. Mitch, Jakubi, Maiba, Karua, some of the best players in the world had tried and failed. The 109 just wasn't happening. Did somebody else need to step up to get it done? Well, a few more months passed and 2021 came around. Early that year, Mitch decided to give the 100% grind one more try. He was two seconds away 
and had far more time than that to save in World 8 alone. He could do this. And on February 7th, 2021, Mitch had this run. It bled time early. He got worse luck in World 2 and made a mistake in World 4's first fort. He also had a time loss in 5-2, and had to travel far to fight the Hammer Brothers. As such, he was far behind entering World 6, but he cleaned up some small mistakes there, and had an excellent World 7. This looks familiar. Mitch was a bit behind, but had several seconds to save coming up. Just once, World 8 had to be clean. This had to be the time to do it. Surprise, right? I'm not surprised. The one level with the bad RNG. It happened again. Another time loss in World 8. Was the 109 just cursed to never exist? All Mitch could do now was finish out the run and see what time he got. In 2016, Karua paved the path. In 2020, Maiba and Shikubi provided hope. And in 2021, Mitch made it a reality. It wasn't a perfect run, but aside from taking damage, which cost a couple seconds, Mitch finally had a great World 8. The whole community could take a breather. The 109 was real. But the breather didn't last very long. Just a month and a half later, Mitch lost his world record. And the runner to take it was Maiba. The same guy who missed the first 109 months earlier thanks to a bit of a meltdown in World 8. But this time, there was no meltdown. He got a 109.58, beating Mitch by frames. Maiba ended up missing some of the toughest P-Speed strategies that Mitch got. 4-5 and 5-1 in particular are two of the toughest spots in the run to get P-Speed. Ultimately, Maiba wasn't able to get either of them. Instead, he aimed to clean up mistakes that Mitch had made, particularly in World 6. That's pretty much exactly what happened. Maiba bled a bit of time through World 5, but had a nearly mistake-free World 6, despite not getting early P-Speed in 6-4. Even though he lost time in both 7-1 and 7-2, he left himself just enough room to snag the record. I don't know, but 109, yes! Yatta! So, here we are. It's mid-2021. The 109 had been accomplished. Mitch was the first to get it, but Maiba had finally gotten the record he'd been looking for for so long. Everyone was happy. What more was there to do? Well, people have a natural tendency to keep pushing the limits. If their goals have been accomplished, they set new ones. Maybe just to add one more chapter to a storied history. Or maybe to see what the human limits are. It was for all these reasons and more that in July 2021, Mitch returned to do one final grind of Mario 300%. My, my goal time in mind after Maiba beat my run was just to get it back. In Mario 3, every time you break a boundary, massive amounts of pressure is lifted off of your chest. What? 
Oh, what an insane world two. I got off screen wand grab and it's a trick where you can jump off the wall and grab the wand at the top of the screen. And uh, once you do that, you don't have to screen wrap down and it saves about four seconds. You, you kind of tighten up a little bit after off screen wand grab. It gets serious when you get it. World three, one of the biggest ones is the runaway bro. And what that means is one of the hammer brothers that you want to fight as early as possible, right? Because you want them to stop moving. He moves right across level six. And if he does that, every level you beat until you get to level six or past level six, he's going to keep moving. So after getting off screen one grab and then that happened to me, it's a, it's a real gut punch right there because I mean, that's a solid like anywhere between five to even nine seconds, depending on how far he goes. World four just started to work really clean. Um, I don't think I got a massive amount of Hammer Brother movements. And then I got another off screen wand grab. So that, that just completely changed the route again. I mean, it was just a bag of emotions. So we come into world six and I'm I'm playing great, but then I'm just not keeping the tight piece speed strategies that I should be. Uh, six three didn't work, six four also didn't work. And uh, I was getting some pretty big uh, Hammer Brother movements. But then I missed um, one of the newer installments of strategies in seven five by using a P wing and a star. So right there with seven one and seven five was like 10 seconds lost already. I was too far behind on my run. So I had to kind of switch up what I was doing and that involved doing the clips in 7-9, which there's four of them. Odds of you getting them, you know, all first try are very small, but they just save enough time that if you go for them and get them all, you might be able to save the run. Now, the issue with that is that if you get all four of them, there's nowhere to get your fire flower. So I had to change up my routing on the fly and go for the hammer suit uh, strategy, which is pretty close to the same for the end part of World 7. So in 7-9, going for the clips, uh, I got 2-1-2-1. Two, one, two, one. And what that means is that with the four clips, two for the first one took me two tries, one was first try, the third clip was second try, and the fourth clip was one try. Yeah, so we're, we're approaching World 8 and we just had to do this on the fly hammer suit. You know, don't overextend it, just try and get the strats that you know. And so 8-1, and 8-2 and 8-4 went uh, pretty smooth. I didn't have any massive mistakes that cost me a whole lot of time. And then we just uh, clutched out uh, Bowser's Castle. Yes! What? No way! No way! It felt great to get the world record back from Maiba and to know that I was able to come and bring it back and get a time that, you know, better represents my ability. It, it, it felt really good. After getting the record back with a run like that, I mean, I had Runaway Bro in World 3. I mean, that, that's such a massive time loss. And I was feeling very consistent, so I, I just didn't want to stop there. I wanted to keep going and see if I can uh, get that free World 3 time save and maybe a couple more off-screen wand grabs, see what happens. In World 2, I didn't get the off-screen wand grab, so I automatically lose four seconds. We all know that I got the runaway bro and that is a big time save if I don't get it. And luckily enough, I didn't get that. We came and clutched out a world one, two, and three at pretty much being on pace with the world record. Nothing crazy. World four is a great example of soul crushing. And then I got a movement of four and a movement of six and it, it really pushes you down because world four has got a lot of hard strategies. To keep the run going. I have time to save in world six. Uh, yeah, let's just keep going. So World 6 World six actually came out pretty smooth. I didn't have uh, any big mistakes. I started World 7 being behind by about two and a half seconds or something. I need to clutch out 7-1 first try, which I did, which was uh, really good. 7-2 went well. 7-5 though is another level with big time save. I didn't get the clip in the previous world record and uh, I do nail it, which is uh, really good. So at that moment right there, I know, okay, this run is real now. We nailed 7-7, seven, seven. we got that third try, which is the same, so we didn't lose any time. And then we just finished off World 7 normally with Fire Flower, which brought me in somewhere around minus seven seconds uh, compared to the world record. So it was serious at that point. With this run, I was finally able to execute some of uh, some new P-Speed strategies in World 8 in the hand levels, where you use a star and eight trap one, uh, and you turn back and you get like P-Speed. I was able to do that in this run, and then I got a P speed strategy in Hand Trap 2, which is another about a second time save.
right? <laughs> Being able to finally clutch out a semi-decent World 7, Clips worked, 7-7, uh, seven, seven, third try, that's everything you would ask for in a World 7, so I felt really good about this run, so I was, uh, I was really happy with it. Did your goals shift at all after getting the 52, or were you like, let me just keep going and see what time I can get? So my answer is, I have no idea why I kept going. So it was a normal day. I was just doing my normal runs um, and World 1 went really well. And uh, World 2, I got some pretty decent RNG um, and the run was looking good. And then all of a sudden I got an off-screen wand grab. And that is the best way uh, to start your 100% runs, off-screen wand grab. And I started to get all movements of one in World 3. And I was like, is this actually going to be like the God World 3 run? Did the normal strats, uh, banked on some Hammer Brother RNG, and World 3 uh, cleaned up really nicely. World 4 normally ends a lot of 100% runs, a lot of weird movements, um, but luckily for me, I ended up being uh, 0.08 off my gold, so absolutely everything that happened in World 4 was what I wanted to happen. We had an amazing World 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is incredibly rare in 100%. Uh, I opened up World 5 with a movement of 4. Yup. Right away, first movement, a movement of four. And then another movement of four. Two movements of four in a row, let's go, baby. And then another movement of four. We got another one, three movements of four in a row. What a surprise. And I got another movement of four. Four movements in a row, baby, let's go. So the rest of World 5 went, went really well. Um, for the most part in World 5, I did manage to successfully do all the peace feed strategies that I want to do. World 6, the Hammer Brothers were really nice to me and I didn't make any other slip ups, so I actually came out of World 6 ahead. Normally I'm pretty nervous when I'm ahead of the world record going to World 7. I had standard nervous, but this wasn't anything crazy special at the moment. So the first half of World 7 went really, really well. 7-1 uh, first try and I got fast 7-2. 7-5 though went beautifully. I managed to get the star, the P-Wing, get that clip uh, perfectly, and I was able to get a good tail swipe, clean under, keep all my speed. Because at first I was saying, you know, when I enter World 7, it's not like anything special, but World 7 is starting to make everything that happened before that amazing. So I'm very nervous at this point. After getting 7-1 and 7-5, I am really, really nervous. I was so like blown away that I actually nailed it first try on a run like that. I just did not believe that I got a first try. I couldn't believe it. You rarely ever maximize your gameplay with 7-7 seven, seven perfectly. As soon as I nailed 7-7, seven, seven, I was extremely nervous and I had to go into 7-9 and we ended up clutching 7-9 with an actual time save. We were able to clutch out the fortress and clutch out the uh, Piranha Plant stage. It was by far the best World 7 I've ever had, alongside the best run I've ever had, as you can tell, but it was, um, it was insane. It was insane. So after a World 7 like that and a run like that, going into World 8, I was extremely nervous. There's so many little things that can screw you up. I'm on this run that is just absolutely insane. After all those thoughts running through my head, we, we approach hand stage one, and I actually nailed it with the start. Eight one worked out okay. Eight two. I was surprised worked out okay. One of the things to note with Bowser's Castle is that the three hardest things I would say in the level is the statue room at the end, getting P-Speed there, uh, the one-up clip, and then the last one is the duck jump at the very end on the donuts. Once you get past the donut spot, you can say to yourself, oh my god, I actually did it. However, Bowser does have one pattern where he can jump and shoot the fireball at the same time. And when he does that, the fireball will be shot where you're standing. You can't avoid it. There's nothing you can do.
I'm so shaky. Oh, holy! Whoa, what? No way! No way! Oh my god, I can't even... It ended up being my most impressive run that perfectly represented my abilities as a gamer, which never happens in speedrunning. Everyone in speedrunning is always trying to chase their potential and you never hit it. It is a run where I don't ever have to go back for it again, but I'm going to, um, but I don't have to, which, which is really cool. Nearly two years have passed since this run, and it's remained on top without any close calls. To this day, there are runners actively trying to beat it, including Mitch himself. As incredible as it is, one day this record too will fall, just like all the ones that came before it. This has been the history of Mario 300% World Records. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to be notified when I upload a new video, please hit that subscribe button. Thanks!